Okay, welcome to the 64th episode of An Evolving Man podcast. Today I'm ex excited to be speaking to Trish Brennan. Trish is the CEO and Principal Trainer of Leading Edge Communication. She coaches women who want to have more confidence in their relationships, be more assertive, establish healthy boundaries and radically improve the quality of their lives through enhanced communication and relationship skills. She is also the author of The Straight Talk and the book How to Change, How to not rush change the game. How to change the game. I wrote the long last bit. Well, welcome, Trish. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. So I also have my wife here today, Michelle Dawn Silcox. And how I love to begin the podcast is just for you to share a little bit about your journey. Um, how did you get into the work you now do? Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. I came from it. I'm a mother of two boys and I had a very difficult marriage that it was my absolute abiding passion to try to hold it together. Um, same with my family of birth, my family of origin. Um, it was my number one priority above anything and everything else to try and heal wounds in my own family. And that kind of led into a natural evolution into wanting to help other families who were struggling with similar issues. And that's kind of where it all began. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So Sorry. Apologies. No worries. <laughs> so in your, your book, listening to the straight talk you mentioned a clarion call for women yes. and for men what is the clarion call i think that there are some subjects that are very difficult to talk about that um i've been in a number of women's groups online where the subjects i discuss can be misinterpreted i think by nature of, when you talk to women about matters of abuse and uh, particularly marriages and close relationships, there can be, first of all, there's often a reticence to even admit that that's going on, to acknowledge that that's going on. And when you talk about a shared responsibility, very often you can meet reticence about that too, that, you know, there's a, there's this victimhood um, kind of a paradigm that a lot of women still cling to. There are many more women, I think, that are will, willing to see that it's or any relationship. It takes two people. Um, but there is still quite a bit of reticence to acknowledge that it's a dynamic. It's not just a one way street. Um, so I've um, I've experienced some people holding back about that and I've even had comments I've made I'm very careful about how I speak and write and you know always try to think ahead how, how this might affect somebody else and I've seen that comments I've made that are very sensitively handled have been removed from women's groups because no we don't want to go there mm. we're not to talk about that mm. I'm okay. sorry I don't, if you asked a question there I've lost the question somewhere but it was just the clarion call what, the clarion, is, what yes. is the clarion call to men and women? It, it's a it's a shout it from the roof to, rooftops almost that we have to start talking about this stuff, this real stuff, because until we do, how can we ever resolve it? How can we ever find a path or a bridge, as I like to refer to it, between one camp of belief and another camp of belief? It's it's like there's a void exists in the middle and somebody has to be brave enough. So I put that call out. It's interesting, actually, the first book I started, which I've is probably going to be the last one I'll finish because it's, it's a deep subject, mentions about the call. Yeah. It's like, come forward, come to the table, be present to this conversation, because until we do, we can't put it right. We can't begin to open dialogue when we're still, ooh, can't go there. So that's what the clarion call is to me. Mm. So what are the subjects that we need to be talking about? And yeah, I'd love you to maybe that we start the conversation. Okay. 
um, the subjects, I started out wanting to make or, or raise awareness about the role modeling we do as adults, often with our own, you know, thing baggage that we've brought, the the wounds that we've carried forward from our own childhood. Um, I wanted to to um, kind of reach out and appeal to people to be willing to overcome that and to start talking about how we should be relating to one another. So I do talk about um, the effect of how we behave, not just women and men, but the whole thing, you know, how we model relationship with one another. Um, so I want to, um, I was initially to reach out to men around me because I found in a one-to-one -one relationship, and I think this is common to, to many women in relationships, my partner, my then partner, who I'm good friends with now, I have to say, um, would not be open to discussing how his behaviour as, uh, for, for his 50% of the relationship, if you like, how that was rolling out to our sons and how, you know, I was always willing to look at my own and see, you know, what can I do better? What, what's wrong for you? Um, I wanted to kind of get that conversation going. So there was, there was a lot of behaviour that I felt was very negative towards our sons and the whole relationship, the whole dynamic of our relationship I thought there was a lot that needed to change but there was no real willingness to to have that conversation so I started to look at ways to get men together in groups to mentor teenage boys in groups some of whom may have a father at home and some who may not um but that was the idea was to if if men won't listen to women the women who are hurting when they're saying, look, this is what's wrong for me because I didn't generally get asked that question. Um, I was always asking it, but I didn't get it back. That was my first approach that maybe we can do this a different way. We can look socially at what's going wrong around relationships and how men and women relate to one another. I got going with that and got quite a lot of, of good feedback for it, but I couldn't get the funding together to get that off the ground so it was a bit of a case of okay rewind what other ways can I influence change and that's where I started to think about well women are generally more approachable and open to change and to looking at self self-awareness and all of that and generally as as the people who have been um, taught compassion um, more openly or more readily perhaps than the male population are I thought we've got a chance to, or I've got a chance to reach out to women. So that's why I made the, I would call it a diversification because the other thing is still in the background. I'm still wanting to do that. But it's more the case now that, okay, there are women having these issues who were in the same boat as me. You know, maybe their children are, are suffering consequences as, as mine were. And that was my thought. I could still do this work, I can still help to heal family and couples and, and bring relationships into a better alignment, but I'm going to take the route through the more willing, the more open door. So that's how I ended up doing the, the work I'm doing for the moment. Mm. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. Would you like to say anything, mm -hmm. Bob? Mm. Yeah, I think it's very very important it's like I just look at my friends around me as well of uh, and in relationships the difficulty of communicating and then it's like watching that and seeing that for myself when I was younger when my son was younger and he was at home it was like oh realizing you know my mother's patterns that were coming out in in you know the way I speak the things that I do and sort of like grabbing myself and and looking at different ways of being able to do that but still seeing around me today it's like the problem in relationships and how a lot of people are single <laughs> you know it's like you know some of my friends who are still single because that ability to com communicate is so difficult it's so so difficult you know and I think 
I always said it because I was a Yorkshire girl. I just said, you know, I, I put my cards on the table. I always have in my relationships, you know, it's like, and then you go from there. It's like, right, let's talk about this. And I've been quite adamant about that because, um, yeah, just seeing if we don't, what happens? And the really? messes everything can get into. And then, yeah. like you say, it's like, then you're carrying that angst in you and your children can feel that. You might not be saying anything, but it's a big impact. And they're actually feeling that. Um, and so, yeah, that's why. Yeah, I totally agree. It's so important to communicate. We're not taught those skills, are we, really? We, we learn by default from our parents who carried forward their own baggage. Mm -hmm. And we don't really get taught communication at school. We might get taught how to run a country or fly a rocket or, you know, write software or whatever, but we don't get very much real quality education around how to communicate, how to negotiate, how to have difficult conversations, how to set boundaries, how to uphold boundaries. You know, all these vital human skills we need are kind of bottom of the list. Yeah. So my, my take really is we need to sort of open up and be playful with with the whole thing and just say, okay, let's start again. How yeah. do we do this better? And yeah. and not saying, well, you did this and you said that and you know you're you fly off into a rage or you sulk or whatever it might be, but to come together in a place of playful exploration to say, we know, we all know that we didn't get taught these skills. How can we do it better? Yeah. And to just come to it from that perspective so that's really what I try to bring you know that even though we're often when I'm dealing with a client there may be emotions involved you know and I, I've sat and cried with somebody who's in tears when I'm coaching because it's an emotional subject but you can bring light to it too you can bring that sense of playfulness and I think people appreciate that you know it's what's needed yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah how about you Piers what do you yeah, and I feel that as you say that, one of my guests about a month ago, he said that uh, the vulnerability is our superpower. And I, when I'm coaching someone or working with someone, if they're in tears, or even if they're not, sometimes I'm in tears. And it's like, this is it. This is, and I think Michelle's taught me this. I've learned from others as well, this idea that, you know, a man cries with his shoulders back and his head up rather than collapsing and going, oh, and so that's what I'm seeing more and more is that, yeah, we need to be vulnerable. And I, I agree with the education. It's like, uh, I think our, um, our son said the same thing. It's like they don't teach many of these things at school. They don't teach you how to, you know, manage your checkbook or, you know, earn a living. And none of these things. It's like, the yeah, um, and definitely not relationships. I think it's Eric from in the art of loving the um the psychologist you know he says and i think also it says something along the lines that you know if we want to learn a skill we want to be good at something then we have to practice it we have to study yeah and when do we do that for love for relationships like you say we just fall into it yeah it's very often when it's all con coming unraveled, isn't it, that we start to look a bit more deeply. I think we have to be in enough discomfort and pain to be willing to give something our attention, mm -hmm. which is a shame because how many marriages have broken down? In fact, I saw something, I can't remember if I mentioned this to you before, but in doing some research recently, I found that loneliness, according to ONS, the Office of National Statistics, um, has said that loneliness has increased very I can't remember what the percentages were, but in a, a very big way. And a lot of the effects um, on those figures are men who are living on their, their own between the ages of 45 and 65, I think, so 45 and 60 something, mm -hmm. um, who are now living alone. And usually it's women who instigate divorce. The highest statistics are women instigate divorce. So, you know, that's the tragedy of it, isn't it? That people end up living on their own, excluded from family, because they never really learned how to communicate, how to be vulnerable. Yeah. As you say, you know, I think you, you hit something really hard on the head there, that we need that. We can't really have a connected relationship without vulnerability. Mm -hmm. No, no. 
So in your book, you talk about patriarchy. Yeah. And I'd love you to speak a bit about, about what you see patriarchy is. Um, and then, yeah, how it impacts. Because I saw a post on LinkedIn, I think it was a couple of days ago, you put it up, about how patriarchy affects women, but also men. So I'd love you to share a bit. Yeah, I, I think that, again, it's one of those words that people... Or to you kind of automatically attach a meaning to it that means we're talking about men. Do you remember the, um, I think it was at Gillette that had that advert that was talking about we can do better yeah. and a lot of their customers jumped ship mm -hmm. because the, the message they were receiving was that um, all men are bad and we're all doing a really bad job. Mm -hmm. And I actually felt that that was pretty brave of Gillette because they're saying what I say in my um, the straight talk really is that it's not saying patriarchy doesn't mean men it just doesn't it's a culture the way I see it it's a a way of being human that's supposed to work but it doesn't work for everyone and I've, I've certainly increasingly seen now that that men are beginning to talk about it you know you see talks online and what have you that if we have a culture that is mostly created by one gender without consultation with the other. How can it take on board all the qualities of the other, like the compassion, like the empathy, like the ability to step into somebody else's shoes? If we don't create the culture from that position, how can it possibly embrace the needs of the whole group? It can't. So to me, when, you know, if I, I'm, I'm still a bit hesitant about using the word in certain circles anyway, because it, it gets perceived straight away as, oh, no, we're not going there. We're not, you're a man basher. Nothing could be further from the truth. It really can't. I just see it as a culture um, that strips away for women. Um, you know, we're not allowed to have strong feelings by this culture, you know, expressing anger. You get, you, you hear the phrase, you've got an anger issue. And I say, well, I've no more got an anger issue than I've got a happy issue or a playful issue. It's just part of the whole. And I would say, you know, where women get stripped of those qualities, men get stripped of the ability and the desire to be soft, to be in touch with their feelings, to be able to show their passion for a woman and or, or for anything, you know, and to have those qualities acknowledged as, as I just referred to, I've no more got an anger issue, than a man who's able to express his soft feelings and to be you know, expressive in whatever way he feels without being judged as being a wuss or too soft for his own good or, you know, he's menstrual. You know, those kind of things, insulting remarks that get linked to men. It's stripping away the core values of being human. Surely the core of being human involves the emotions. So that's why I think patriarchy has a lot to answer for in terms of the cutting away of certain elements of both women and men. And then women tend to get, you know, we're the soft target because we love men. And then we, we tend to get dumped on. I think things that men can't say to other men or to the, to the patriarchal culture, that's, well, I'm not having that anymore. You know, I'm, I'm a whole person. Either accept me as a whole person or don't dictate to me how I should be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trish. As you speak, you know, as we I shared before we began, my work is a lot with men, boarding school, trauma. As you speak about the patriarchy, women can't share strong, can't ha have strong feelings. Then men, you know, uh, can't the ability to, and desire to be soft. They can't have that. It's like that's what we learn in these institutions. That's what we learn at boarding school. One, you can't have strong feelings. The feminine is to be rejected. I was speaking to someone last week. I'm going to have them on my podcast in a few weeks. He said that they only had a few girls in their school, but he said everywhere they went, they were spat on. They were abused. This is a boarding school. And this is we, we learn to hate the feminine at these schools. And the reason is because our mothers have kind of basically left us. So we learn this inner hatred and when we speak of patriarchy, I'm thinking, yeah, I can see where a lot of it comes from. Mm. 
So we just... there's a thing that sorry. Go I on. was gonna say, Michelle, would you want to say anything to that? Yeah, it's like for me, I, it always takes me back to school and thinking, yeah, it was like always the mind and the brain. It's like we shot ahead with this technology and it was like very much the mind and mental and thinking. Um, but the emotional, and we often, you know, associate mental with male, but the emotional body was like, hasn't caught up. It's like, you know, you look at oh, sort of, I think we're still in the playground, you know, well, you <laughs> made me feel like this, you know, and it's pointing, we're in the playground because it, it felt like, yeah, the mental was, oh, yeah, everything mental was supported and good and, you know, ideas and, you know, but the actual emotional never got addressed. Mm. And it felt like, yeah, we're behind emotionally. It's like because people can't cope with them. They don't know what to do with them. Yeah. And especially in relationships, it's like, you know, I always say like, woman is like a representation of life or the ocean or the wind you know she's like very the physical side to life and um it's like yeah so we should be expressive very expressive and you know the masculine not necessarily men i think there's both in us both but the masculine is like the consciousness and you know it's like should be able to hold that feminine because he's got it with inside him and we should be able to rather than fight you know masculine and feminine he's like balance that and see you know where we work together and that's very much what we've done in our relationship is like look at it that way as a way of uh, being able to learn more mm -hmm. and yeah. accept more of that emotional side to us yeah, I completely agree. It's like we've been cut. It's as if, because we, I do see it that we get, I, I tend to use the phrase emotionally castrated, although it might be seen as a bit hard, but to me that's what happens to men. And I don't mean that in offence to men, I mean it that that's what patriarchy does. It's mm. as if they said, okay, we've got two holes here, let's cut a piece off this and a piece off this so we can stick them together to make a new hole. Mm. But it doesn't work like that. Mm. You know, we have to be whole in ourselves to be any good in any kind of connection. Otherwise, you're always looking for the lost bits mm -hmm. because it's part of you. I don't need you to make me whole and you don't need me to make you whole. Let's come together in, in wholeness and, you know, be uh, willing to bring out the best in one another and com and, and uh, complement each other. Mm -hmm. So, in a, you know, a healthy relationship you, you, that you can you can be strong and less strong sometimes and so can your partner so when you're feeling less strong then you can perhaps bond you know rely on that bond or, or turn to that bond in the in the other person that, that capacity in the other person so that they can complement you mm. and you can do the same for them totally. that's the way i ask it mm. totally agree mm. Mm. yeah yeah it's Something else, let me, sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to add before, um, one of the things that happens with boys at the, at the normal time is around, around about the age seven or thereabouts, a boy will start to gravitate more towards the male figure in his life, mm -hmm. who hopefully there is one there. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about public school, I mean, I've read and listened to quite a lot of people talking about that kind of thing, that the boys are, are being taken to school. It may be the same for girls, taken away from their parents at three and four and five. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. soon. And so that natural process is almost, it's just negated completely. And let's go against that. Let's take the child away from mm. the parent before they're even emotionally capable of dealing with that. I can't imagine the, the trauma that must cause, but perhaps you can... Yeah, I mean, it's terrific. And I think people still don't really understand it enough. Nick Duffel, Joy Chavron, many in the UK really understand this. But globally, you know, and it does affect a global audience because so many of the leaders have been to boarding school. And, you know, some people say, oh, well, 11, it's okay. And it's like, 
or 13. I mean, 13, you're wanting to, you're moving through puberty, you learn about sexuality, you want space for yourself. You know, even 13 for me is too early. I think 16, boarding school, yeah. But 11, you know, people say, you know, I have work, I work with people who are five, who went to boarding school age five. You know, um, I know people who went age four. You know, I've heard of people going age two. Uh, and it's like, yeah, I think what happens is, uh, as Joy Sharon says, this child is effectively homeless, no longer fully belonging at home nor at school. And that's what happened to me. So I was 11. It's like I left home, but I left everything behind. I used to be into skateboarding. You get to the school and, it's, and top trumps. No one else is doing it. So I let those things go. You know, people who are into Dungeons and Dragons, they started doing it. They got so badly bullied, they stopped doing that. So it's like you therefore, you know, have to leave home behind. But then you don't fit in at school either because you are an individual and it's an institution. And I think it was George Monbiot, uh, the um, the Guardian journalist, said that something along the lines of you're going into an institution, whereas when you're at home with your boys, you would have negotiated, right, you want to go out? Not tonight. Yeah, you can go tomorrow or whatever. There's no in, in negotiation in a boarding school. You're in or you're out. You're one of the crowd or you're not. You're, you know, you're in school, you're expelled. It's like black and white that's not how a child needs to be brought up that's creates you know we become emotionless our emotions are castrated if you showed emotions in these schools you were literally laughed at if you were uh, got angry it was psycho psycho and you've got 20 30 people laughing at you trying to goad you on all the time or if you cried it was laugh it laughter you know because that was an essence of them that was in them. And it was much better to attack you than for it to happen to them. And therefore, as Nick Duffel said, says wealth doesn't trickle down as we're told, but beliefs and patterns of behavior, they do trickle down into society. So where does this come from? From our leaders, you mm. know, from those people in charge. And I think Jackson Katz, you sent me that interview to listen to. He said, change should fall on adult men with power. Mm. Uh, yeah yeah but yes that's that's what i feel isn't it though um more of a grassroots it's never going to come from men with power really because they don't have that whole that wholeness that whole capacity to i i actually don't think they're equipped to lead with the skills that are needed the qualities that are needed i really don't no so it looks like you agree from the shaking <laughs> head. Oh, definitely. It's like I, I sometimes look at them and, again, it's like I always refer to, God, it's just like the schoolyard, the bickering. It's like, you know, I, I've been with elders that are wise elders, you know, that are full human beings, you know, with this, such love and beauty but they have authority as well. You know, it's like they're so rounded and beautiful. And then you look at what we've got in our, you know, as our leaders and things. And it's like, oh, my God. It's like, yeah, we're stuck. It's like we're in the playground and, like, and all these noises in the Houses of Parliament and the Commons <laughs> or whatever. And it's like, I can't believe it. You know, it's like, what are we watching here? You know, it's... And it's it hard to listen to, isn't it? Because it jangles. Yeah. It does for me, and I think it probably does for you based on how you're reacting. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. But it just seems like that, you know, we need to grow up, and especially emotionally, you know, that if, if you can't sit and have a discussion without all that going on, you know, it's like, yeah, we can have, discussions that get quite heated and passionate about but the way you look at it on <laughs> there it's like oh my god it just seems like yeah we're stuck emotionally we're really stuck back you know and I think what was it Jordan Peterson did that discussion about 
Um, and he said it in psychological terms, which was brilliant that, you know, actually we're going further back now. We're like two year olds. If you watch <laughs> how people behave and he gives this whole yeah. speech about it. It's incredible. And I think, goodness me. Yeah. When you look at it, it's like, yeah, it's definitely, you know, we need to grow up emotionally. You know, we've done all the mental thing and we've made things and, you know, these computers and everything, but we left the emotions behind somewhere. Mm. And so we're stunted and it's like, you know, gosh, if we all understood emotions more, um, I think, you know, in any relationship, you know, we'd do so much better. Yeah. I mean, it was like that, isn't it? It's like, to me, even how we, how we, I want what you've got and my, my guns are bigger than your guns, so I'm going to come and beat you into submission so I can take your oil or whatever it may be, your gold or whatever. We, to me, I just see, what well, it's funny that you should use that phrase because I, I, I think that all the time that we're like children. Yeah. Why yeah. don't we just grow up? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. stop this. And until the rest of the population can see that, you know, we're all kind of being sucked around from pillar to post with by this machine that is basically patriarchy. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that everything about patriarchy is bad. No. You know, it's, there are obviously good things as well, but it, it's just like we're living in a massive playground mm -hmm. where, you know, even think watching TV. I mean, I don't actually watch TV very often. It's very rare. I might put for a movie or something but when I used to live at home I was still married it was one of the things I was glad to leave behind <laughs> um, the you know programs that were, where there's a panel of judges I won't name particular programs a panel of judges who sit there like god you know and somebody get they invite people in who they know they're going to rip to shreds because they're obviously auditioned but they they you know they hand up in the air and and you know everything the camera's always on the judges and what have you and i just think it's such a silly system that how how do we turn so that we we laugh at somebody being ridiculed and they're going to be ridiculed for all time because it's still there on the internet when they're old men and women mm. you know that, that whole culture of i know better than you instead of e equality i don't know if i'm making myself very clear here but it to me it's all part of that schoolyard thinking mm. you know we, we're not considering one another we're not thinking about the consequences of our actions you know how we affect one another and the lifelong destruction that that can cause mm. 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 Yeah. Uh, nick duffel says in his book wounded leaders he says it's like the inner child because it gets stranded it gets stranded inside the person so they end up running the show when they get older. So when we get older, it's like me. I still felt like a little boy in my late 20s. And I had just come off a podcast talking a bit about initiation, that I had initiation from boyhood to manhood. And boyhood's really about reflecting it's all about me, which is not a bad thing. You know, the young boy needs to find out who he is. But then the transition to manhood is how may I serve? How may I be of service? And I don't see that with many of our leaders interestingly someone was pointing out that most of the current prime ministers for the last 20 odd years after they've left office they've gone on to make a lot of money uh, through contracts or speaking there's only one leader who um in the last 20 years or so makes money from speaking but he gives it all away to charity and that is Gordon Brown. And he's the only one of recent times who wasn't a boarder. And I just thought, and I just thought, ah, he's serving. Yes, he's giving his talk, but then he gives his money to charity rather than, you know, again, I think Boris Johnson has made five million pounds since he left office in September through giving talks for himself. And that's what we learned at school. We learned it's all about me. We're an island unto ourselves because we've been abandoned. We have, there's no one else to take care of us. And they still have that abandoned little boy in the playground in charge of them until they do that inner work, that vulnerability, checking in. How am I doing? Mm. What do I feel? Oh, yeah. That, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I can resonate. Thank you. Wouldn't it be interesting to see one of these 
self-serving people, uh, you know, how they'd think differently if they were hanging off the edge of a cliff onto, uh, holding onto a, a branch that was barely strong enough to hold them. Who would they rather walk by? Mm -hmm. Somebody that was brought up in a public, uh, sorry, in a, yeah, in a public school who might think, oh, well, if I let him drop, I can, you know, I can take his power or his money or his influence or whatever. Or somebody that's got all the, the full range of human capacities who would be, give me a hand. Mm. Let me pull you up. Mm. Who would you want? The person with all the full range of skills or the one who's been taught not to care about anybody else. Just mm -hmm. interesting, <laughs> interesting That's thought. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that is. And and often in my work, I, I have women who reach out to me who are married to an ex-border, to one of these leaders. And they say, what do I do? Or some say, I'm, I'm leaving my partner. I can't do anything because he won't admit it. You mean, you spoke in your book about women cracking the hearts of men open. Mm. Could you speak a bit about that? Basically, maybe both of you. How do women crack the hearts open of people like myself who, you know, as Michelle can tell you, has been very hard work at times. I think the man's got to be ready, or the owner of the male heart has got to be ready, you know, because, I mean, my ex-husband didn't go to public school. Um but it's it's the to me again it's the patriarchal thing that that's filled it in you know almost like they've put polyfiller over it until it's gone rock hard, you know it's it's so protected, but and and I think also it's very vulnerable, and it's scary to be vulnerable for the best the best of us you know for any of us. So if you've been taught that you're going to be ridiculed or excluded or beaten up or whatever it might be, if you dare to show that vulnerability, then how can we find the strength to to do that? So I don't I don't think, I think I, I wrote about it in that that's what we feel. Oh, I'm speaking with a, a big brush, I know, but in general, I think it's across the board, I think more women will struggle with that than, than maybe don't, or, or that certainly than maybe men do. Um, you know, we, we long to find the tool to crack open that hardened heart but until the other person is willing to own what the problem is we're never going to get in because all those years of hurt I mean it, I think any of us struggle when we feel emotional because of the way culture is to allow it to just flow I've got no choice. I'm an emotional being. I, I can't help it. You know, I'm, I'm going to cry if I need to cry. <laughs> and even if I'm working with somebody, as you've said yourself, Piers, it, it, when you see somebody else going through emotion, then you can't help but feel that emotion. Perhaps in the wider world, that's why we have fantastic music with movies, isn't it? Because that does reach the hardened heart, mm -hmm. but they don't have to interact. Mm -hmm. And it's easier, I think, for somebody to be open to a, a sad film than it is to be personally open because that means I've got to interact with you and that there's continuance there. Whereas in a movie like, oh, back to normal when it's finished, you know, like, like going down the pub or <laughs> whatever it may be, you know, you don't have to have that continuance with listening to beautiful music that makes your soul sore. Mm -hmm. But in the one-to-one -one relationship, it can be, I think, really difficult to be in that space of having an open heart and I think as I said before it can be um you have to be so in pain and maybe have lost so much I remember I'm sorry going to just shoot off a tangent here I remember working with a relate counsellor when I was going through my stuff and she said sometimes men like will have to lose everything before they'll look at themselves you know because it's got so painful so critical and if you've lost your children as well you've lost all the things that meant anything to you maybe then that hardened heart is more likely to open up and i don't think it's somebody else can in my experience and my learning i don't think it's possible for somebody else to open that hardened heart it's a bit like scrooge isn't it <laughs> the ghost the go the visits from the ghosts of christmas past to get through mm. But if you're so protected and so hidden behind this wall of either indifference or, or 
pretense and or pretense. Mm. You're not going to let anybody open that hardened heart because it's too dangerous. It's too vulnerable. Mm. That's my feeling. I don't know Thank about you. yourself. What about you? you have anything to respond to that? I'm just thinking about me and you and that. Please do. Just knowing that you've got to build trust, mm. you know, um, and realising that, yeah, one of the the things I did and realising when I was younger was, again, it's that language of not pointing the finger you know, it's like, I feel this when you do that rather than you made me feel this. Mm. And by continuing and building that trust in the relationship um, and talking, but not, you know, and yeah, I would, I'd like quash when I was angry or upset. I'd just go away, take a deep breath, sit in, and it's like, but I, again, it's feeling, I'd feel into where Piers was at and really feel him and how I then could communicate because I believe us women are amazing at feeling into spaces. It's a it's a power of women. Um, and so it was being able to go, okay, well, if he's feeling that, then, you know, if I'm sort of angry about this, that's not going to have an effect and it's like, so I'd breathe and I didn't feel I was losing my power. I thought my power was able to feel. And then I would think about how would I communicate? So I'd mm. communicate in a certain way where he didn't feel I was getting at him, but he'd, he'd, his heart would open and tears would come. And it's like, oh, I didn't realize that's what was, you know, like if he'd carry around that anger but not realising he's carrying it around. He might not be angry at me or shouting, but just in his being, you know, he's carrying that around. And so it was like, what are my skills? How can I, you know, communicate? And my communication and learning about more my feminine of, oh, I can feel all this. So how would I need to communicate with peers mm. so that it's not going to, he's not going to, block off from me and I found I could do it and then you would you know feel it of mm. how I felt because I'd share that um and then it built this trust because we could communicate mm. so it's been trust and you know learning those little bits of things we can do in our communication to build that trust yeah and I almost I hear you. Just quickly, I'm sorry to draw just a very quick one. I think still it's wonderful what you've said and I agree with you. And I I've been in that place myself of continually trying to feel into things, but I still believe the person on the other side whose heart is a bit closed still has to be willing and ready. And I, when I've listened to some of your work here from other podcasts. I can sense that in you. It's very, very obvious in you. You have this gentleness and this softness about the way you speak. I think you you clearly were ready. And uh, Michelle, you've been there at the right time mm -hmm. to be able to meet that that opening mm -hmm. and, and coax it out. But I, I definitely in my experience that there are people I know and have known who are still not there, at, mm -hmm. you know, heading towards 70. Mm, yeah 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 you're, you're right it's that sovereignty right am i going to choose to do this am i going to take the the step you know and i noticed in my own journey that i'd had enough i wanted to commit suicide in my 20s i had to find a solution and often the people who come to me have had enough often sometimes i get wives say oh can you work with my husband it's like well is he ready when it's him who's gone, yeah, I'm tired. I, I can't do this anymore. I want to feel joy and I'm willing to put the work in. Then that's when transformation can happen. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think coming into the relationship, 
you know, and it, it reminds me of my one of my episodes um, with Dr. Claudia Gold, who's a, a pediatrician in her book, talking about attachment and repair and um, this idea that I think as men, we have this misconception that our relationships have to be hunky dory all the time. And if there's not, there's something wrong with us. But what she's saying is 75% of interactions are often um, disrupted. They are discord. And actually the key bit is the repair. Ah, oh, you know, it's like with my wife, we might have an argument or get upset, but it's very quick that we repair. Mm. And it's this, you know, and I think as men, we need to understand that, that that's a really healthy relationship <laughs> that you have discord but it's the repair yeah. and, I, and I, there is a part of our brains which go, Oh no, no, it has to be perfect. And actually, no, it's, it's good that we have upset because then we repair, we get closer, we get closer, we get closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, um, just looking at the time. So we're coming up for, for four o'clock. Um, probably got about 10, 15 minutes left. Anything else that's really, you know, you've written your book, you've, you're passionate. Anything else that you want to share that you've not shared so far about the work you do, Trish? Uh, well, it's, it's a bit, how long have you got? <laughs> I think, you know, the, the main issue for me is that we have to start looking at the culture that we live in are you familiar with Gabor Mate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the most recent book he's released about you know toxic culture. I don't know whether he uses that word in it. I think he was going to use that word in it at one point. Um, but if we live in a culture that's not supportive of healthy human life, there's nowhere else to look than at the culture and to say, okay, how can we be? How can we develop a culture that is supportive? of good human life quality human life and isn't relationships so much a part of that because what we've been so divided in the particular in the last three years um by one thing and another we've not we've we've lost connection rather than built more you know you, you sort of think we're going to evolve as time goes by we evolve but it's like we've gone so far backward mm -hmm. that we've, we've lost connection i think everybody's feeling that Mm -hmm. you know I, I think you'd be you'd be hard pressed to, to talk to anybody who was willing to be open and honest with you that wouldn't see the same say the same thing mm -hmm. that we've lost touch uh, to me i think my biggest drive is to try and get people willing to have the difficult conversations and to try to have those conversations from a place of playfulness of openness of honesty you know to be able to do tough love when we need to do it um you know to be able to see that we're all doing the best we can with the skills that we inherited as we grew up, but to be willing to say, I have to question some of those things, those messages that were given to me by this culture that's, you know, if it was patriarchy and matriarchy and they were, I don't like these words really to just for the sake of getting a point across and they were in balance, we probably wouldn't have an issue. If you mm. think of yin yang, the, you know, the, the it's in balance. Mm -hmm. it's not more yin or more yang it's in balance we've lost that balance so greatly and until we can start saying okay i'm willing to come to the table i'm willing to show up i'm willing to have these conversations without getting crazy mad and without blaming and without saying yes but you and yes but you you know if we could just come together and realize that the healing is going to happen in a place of open dialogue where we can let the past go to in in terms of at least not holding on to what's bad about it, but to say, what I've learned from that is this, how can we bring these things together in a place of greater balance? I think that's to me is the, the hardest part. I, the, as I mentioned to you, I've had women's groups have removed posts that were really very gentle. The minute anybody jumped into a place of defensiveness, or oh, let's take that off. To me, it's like, no, let's stay present. Mm. Let's have the discussion because until we do, we can't heal it. 
it can just stay in that position of yes but you did this and yes but you did that you didn't hear when i said yeah, we can't heal in that place we have to start being open to one another and to the both sides of you know the masculine in the feminine the feminine in the masculine as you say michelle that you know we're all both of those things we all have all of those capabilities patriarchy wouldn't have it mm -hmm. so therefore we need to i think we just need to be willing to to look at things and you with new eyes fresh eyes with more openness more willingness to see you know okay this this is the culture you know i've taken those messages on you know i've had, I've had women i've worked with in delivering a, a trial of the the mentoring program who are so very frightened to show their femininity mm. they were like no we can't have pink oh no no we can't have pink because you know it's like everything that they may have fought against in their careers so far and yet it's when you think about it in a balanced way it's like why not why does it matter but it's because we're all out of whack yeah so yeah it's that that openness i think that's grassroots for me let's not look to the leaders who who haven't got a clue about how to be emotionally balanced let's do it together amongst one another in the kind of work you and i do and uh, i'm not sure Sure, Michelle, what you, whether you, you um you know what work you do if you do if you are um working, but the the little the little people that we all are, let's do it together and not look outside there because we're never going to find it out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you, thank you. You're going to say something, love. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> if I over talked you there, I'd apologise. No, just get no. fired up with the subject. So. so I'm hearing willing to have these difficult conversations, you know, with playfulness, kindness, you know, and sometimes tough love. And then I'm hearing we've lost that masculine, feminine, or patriarchy, matriarchy balance. Um, and then you know, I'm hearing being open to one another, which yeah. You know, I think that's so true. We often go into defensive mode, mm. you know, rather than hearing. <gasps> this is how it feels. Yeah, I think we've lost that ability to listen. You know, mm. it's like people are so, you know, ready to give their view on something. Um, and yet it's so valuable to be able to really listen. Mm. and that's what i see nowadays it's like oh people don't really listen and it's so valuable it's awesome. and uh, and it's just that reaction so you know somebody's not listened to you and it feels quite rude <laughs> because people are just reacting mm. rather than just sit in a minute you know and i found useful uh, i've been in uh, like circles and watching the magic because i did a lot of um shamanic work some years ago and found that sitting in circle the valuable with a talking stick and people go oh you know but it's like yeah but when you hold the stick nobody's allowed to talk and you're having to teach people how to listen because we've forgotten how to listen mm -hmm. but then you see the value of when they realize that no, you can't interrupt, you can't advise, you just have to sit there and listen. And mm -hmm. such a simple thing. But I watched the magic of that happen. And over time, as these people, you know, come together in circle, come together in circle, and it just held this energy that was people actually learning to listen really mm. listen and seeing the value to them of being able to listen and you know it's like and i'm watching you know different podcasts and all this to see what's going on and it's this people have to just respond straight away or react straight away and um yeah i just see you know something that simple of can we listen can we listen to the other person? Can we listen to somebody and understand the value of listening? Awesome. 
and the patriarchy. It's just that fight, you know, oh, we're going to make a killing and, you know, you're arguing and it's just this battle. It's always war and battle and let's make a killing rather than, you know, oh, okay. Mm. That makes me feel, you know, it's like, yeah, we need to learn new skills, I feel. Mm, for sure. Mm. Completely agree. Mm, well, it's like listening, listening to others and also listening to Mother Earth. What's happening? To actually almost grieve what is happening. I can't remember who I was listening to, the importance for us as men and women to actually listen. Because then that gives us, and grieve, because then that gives us the impetus to do something rather than what we do is we're in denial, we're not feeling, and we just keep busy rather than... Oh my God, can you see what's happening here? And actually feel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank you, thank you. So, any more thoughts or reflections? Trish, any idea? I think that there was only one thing I wanted to to add um, a bit earlier on. Um, I must admit, I'm not great with the talking stick. I did used to do a podcast with somebody where we did that, and we were always laughing and falling over one another. I'm quite good at interrupting. things. I don't mean to, you know, be rude about it. And one of my pet hates is when people start talking over you, and don't we see so much of that on TV? Um, but about um, boys. Um, they it's known that boys suffer longer when a marriage say breaks down or the family unit breaks down than girls do mm. and it was kind of relevant to you know what we were talking about before about the age that's appropriate for a boy to be separated from family i wonder what impact that has on boys who've been taken away from their family you know because the girls are taught to at least emote a little bit even though we're, we're still cut out you know we're still have parts of ourselves cut off that's something that um i believe is is pretty well known that you know it takes it, because perhaps we're not boys are maybe not taught to emote and you know are given negative messages about having those characteristics even in them mm -hmm. if it takes that much longer for a boy to recover imagine i can only imagine really what mm -hmm. your own journey must have been like you don't recover unless you do the healing work you know you don't because it's you know again as joy chavron says you know homesickness for her is renamed as and reframed as bereavement you're bereaved and you need that space to cry you've lost everything sure. but we're not allowed to cry because you're going to get bullied or beaten up or laughed at or told come on you'll get over it and then they say, oh, he settled down. No, he's become dissociated. Mm. And those are the people in charge. They're dissociated. They can't connect to their emotions. They can't have empathy for others because they don't have empathy for themselves. They've learned to hate the vulnerable within themselves and therefore they can't have compassion and love for the vulnerable in society. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I totally agree that, you know, it's almost, I loved what... Um, Desmond Tutu did at the end of apartheid. He went round to the townships and the different places around South Africa and they did gatherings in churches and they would talk about the, the abuse which went on and then they would sing and they would dance. And there was very little trauma which went forward according to these reports because they, a lot of them cleared it. And that's almost what we need now is for everyone who's been through trauma and WHO in 2017 said 70% of adults have been through some form of trauma globally. That's mm. a huge percentage, you know? So if we could do that and have these sharing spaces, it's like I was sharing my podcast earlier on today, this uh, Andy's man club, people are able to speak men. It's okay to talk. There's more and more places of this happening. I'm part of the mankind project, which is amazing where men can go and talk and share. Um, so, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. So how do people find out more about your work? Do you have a website or, I don't know, your books on Amazon? 
Um, my main website is the leading edge communication.com. Um, I have a blog at the straight talk blog.com and I've just opened a new one, which is kind of about the straight talk, which is if this is abuse.com. So there, there are places where people can find out more about the work that I do. Right. Well, what yeah, can I just add another quick sneaky one in there before oh, sure. just about what you talk about emotions and energy i think if we, if we think in terms of energy emotions are an energy aren't they very very but is there anything more powerful than emotions and when they're shut down it's no wonder people get depressed it's no wonder people become dissociated as you mentioned that that energy is eating us alive you know, mm -hmm. think of illness, and that's another thing Gabo Mate talks about, isn't it? That, that, that people, like for instance, Lou Gehrig's disease, or what we know in the UK as ALS, you know, the ice bucket challenge, remember? Mm -hmm. People that, he, what, one of the great things he brings into this area is that he, he knows the medical stats, and they they found that people who have ALS or, or Lou Gehrig's disease are very often those people that couldn't say no, who were really nice, nice, you know, because they've it has physiological effects. Mm -hmm. It's a massive danger to shut down emotions. Mm -hmm. Huge. And that they become they become like this, you know, like you think of a volcano, they're all bubbling underneath. Mm -hmm. This magma is all bubbling underneath. And at some point, if it doesn't explode and destroy everything in its path, mm -hmm. it will probably destroy the person who's got it bubbling away inside them. Oh. So it's really important that we you know we start to be in touch with our emotions mm -hmm. and see them as just as you've just expressed so so beautifully when people are talking about it and and um, with Desmond Tutu you said it wasn't it that mm -hmm. when they're able to bring that energy out into song and dance and celebration it's past mm -hmm. everything can mm -hmm. settle down back into um you know homeostasis again until we start treating emotions with that kind of respect that we can allow them to ebb and flow mm -hmm. you know that that would be my invitation is let's let's do that mm -hmm. it's been lovely i'm so grateful to have had the chance to talk to you both today because i think the more people hear other people being open about these things maybe that's a great encouragement to, to say well look they didn't die <laughs> <laughs> you know they were talking to one another about this sensitive stuff and mm -hmm. you know it hopefully is it has been helpful to people so yeah. thank you well wow, pleasure thank you thank you thank you thank you okay <laughs> please guys go and um, visit her websites and uh, go and buy a copy of her book so uh okay take care then trish thank you